My name is Mark Barlet, and I'm going to do a presentation called A Frank Conversation About the F Word. My name is Mark Barlet. I'm the founder and the executive director of the Able Gamers Charity. Um, I chose this picture because when I had the press shots done, um, I've actually lost 100 pounds. So I thought this one was the best press shot I could find because you probably wouldn't even recognize me. I want to, this is the only slide I'm really going to read to you guys, but it's really important for me. From time to time, I'm known for not being the most politically correct as some would expect me to be with the sensitive issues that we're going to talk about. But I live with my disability. And the people that I work with, the volunteers at Able Gamers, and the people we help also have disabilities. And I will tell you that we're not always politically correct about them. And in fact, sometimes we're not at all. And it's because they're real to us. So if I use a term that you don't like, I apologize now. But it's the terms we use among ourselves. I want to tell you guys some stories, because game accessibility has come such a long way in such a short time. And I thought storytelling would be the best way to, to kind of show you how far we've come. You need to know that this is my friend, Steve. There's a picture of me, much heavier. Um, as you guys can see, Steve is profoundly disabled, <clears throat> um, uses a ventilator to breathe. And he's my best friend. I built a ramp onto my house so that he could get to my home. And um, I then subsequently slipped and fell on said ramp and broke my tailbone. That's how much of a friend he is for me. I have been called from a game accessibility specialist, I have to confess, that I am a bully. I'm a bully. And I want to tell you why. Because game accessibility is important, and it's not an option for me. The first story I really want to tell you is about a story with a company, and Steve and I, we were traveling through PAX East. Does anyone know who PAX is? PAX is the Penny Arcade Expo. We were in Boston, and there was this great game that was being demoed, and we were kind of cruising through the aisles, and we didn't really want to wait in line for it. And this gentleman by the name of Mario, we found out later, kind of wanted us to sneak the line. Having a friend who's profoundly disabled is great, just like bringing grandma to Disney World. Oftentimes, you can cut the line. Unfortunately, they had double carpeted their um, booth. So Steve's wheelchair couldn't actually go into it. So they asked us what we were there for. And we were there to show the, talk to them about how this game was going to be accessible. And the woman that was there, she, wasn't, she was kind of a paid um, marketing person. So she's like, I'm not the person to answer that. Let me go get it. And she took our little flyer, and she went into the booth. Um, and she was gone for a few minutes. And a gentleman came out, and he had our flyer, and he had it rolled up. And he goes, what? And I said, hi, my name is such and such. And we wanted to talk to you about how your company, which is actually just three blocks down the road, um, is worrying about how people with disabilities are playing this game. And he took our flyer, and he wadded it up, and he said, I don't really have time for this shit. And he walked back into his booth. Now, this is where platforms like Twitter become pretty amazing. We only had 3,600 followers at the time. And I posted, was just at Rockstar booth, told me don't have time for this shit, hashtag accessibility. So we go about our day because we're just a tiny charity. We don't, you know, it was just a thing that happened. We'll let, we'll let the internet take care of it for us. We go to bed, and I get up early. And about 5.45 in the morning, I check my email. And I have an email from a game company called Rockstar. And they're like, hey, something happened at our booth. We kind of want some information on it. Apparently, the wall is coming down behind me. Um, Oh, OK. <laughs> um, and so I kind of typed out what happened. And you know, we went to the booth and da 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 And I got a response back that said, 
well, we talked to the person you talked to, and they said you were alone. He didn't even notice Steve. In fact, the woman we were talking to said you were standing next to a plant, which is why I say meet my friend the ficus. He wouldn't even look down at Steve. She did say, hey, um, that's not what I heard exactly happened, but your story and the story you have converge enough. What do you want to do? Now, we usually don't ask a lot of people. We just wanted to get a couple of developers on the phone. We saw this as an opportunity to share how game accessibility is important. And the woman said, no, we're not going to do that. This is actually the quote. I did not notice he was there. Was he behind a plant? Kid you not. She said no, and she said that wouldn't do. The disservice we did to you requires us to do more. So why don't you come to us here in New York City? We said, well, we can't afford that. And they're like, We're, we, we got piles of cash. We'll do it for you. Um, so they, this company. Rockstar, I've already given it away, um, bought plane, train tickets. We trained from Pittsburgh to New York. They had a van waiting for us at Madison Square Gardens and the Mario guy that I told you about waiting for us. Gave us a wonderful time in New York, stayed at the Tribeca. Um, the aside to that is Steve was trying to get into his van because it's wheelchair accessible and there was no place on the curb but there was this beautiful Bentley at the end of the block because the Tribeca is owned by Robert De Niro so Steve like rolled up to the Bentley and asked him to move his car so his van, that he was a guest and so his van could get in. So Steve has the pride of saying, I asked Robert De Niro's driver to move his damn car. <laughs> and um, the company was so gracious, they, they talked to it, they actually made several changes to the game in the first patch based on the feedback we had given them. And we've created a great relationship ever since. They helped us get to PAX the next year and the whole nine yards. And this was really a win for us that started really tragically, but turned out to be a really great relationship with a very aloof company who's making much more accessible games. The next story I want to tell you is why I'm being called a bully. And it has to do with the game that used to be incredibly popular called World of Warcraft. Who plays World of Warcraft? I knew it. Ugh. I was going to speak at, at the gaming development, com game GDC, I can't remember what it stands for anymore. It's just GDC to me. And we kept getting people with disabilities reaching out to us saying, hey, I just got banned from World of Warcraft because I'm using macros to help overcome some of the challenges that they've created in their game, and they've banned me for, for, for cheating. You know, and we would ask questions, and you know, sure enough, these people really did have disabilities, and I knew the software that they were using and everything like that. And we kept reaching out to Blizzard so that we could create a relationship to get people unbanned. Now, game companies that have really big followings create spheres around them between the fan and leadership, because fans can be creepy. Um, this is a real hard nut to crack, even for us. So I hatched a plan. And the plan was I was going to GDC to talk about game accessibility. And I needed a way to break through all of the nuts at once. So I created this shirt. Blizzard hates disabled gamers. Ask me for details. And I put out there, and the shirt still exists. It's actually in my closet. I put out there through my game developer friends that this shirt existed and we were going to wear it at GDC. The first day of this GDC, there was a panel that had the CEO of, of Blizzard on it, Pardo, Rob Pardo. That's him right there. I, I sat, was not wearing the shirt, I sat, and then at the end of his panel about microtransactions, people kind of rush the dais, like you guys are all going to rush when I'm done with this talk. And he's just sitting on the end of the stage, and you know, he's holding court, is what I like to call. And he looks at me, and he goes, what do you want? And I said, hey, have you, why, do you, why do you hate people with disabilities? And he goes, you and I need to talk. 
I mean, he just literally locked arms. And as he's doing that, I'm handing my cards to all the press people that have literally turned to face me now. And he goes, you and I need to talk. Can you please wait over there? Talking about cracking through all of the shells at once. So I wait over there, and he said, look, I heard there's this shirt. And I said, there is. He goes, what's your beef with me? And I told him the beef. And he goes, oh, that's actually really important. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And he goes, OK, here's my deal. I am going to send some people to this panel that you're doing. This is their names. That, they are your contacts. But that shirt, I don't want that shirt. And I said, what shirt? I have no idea what you're talking about. And he goes, good. So that's why I was called a bully, because I used the pulpits that I was given to crack through the nuts. So a little bit about the Able Gamers charity. So the Able Gamers charity was founded because my best friend from middle school, who married my, my, my best friend in the military, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And we played EverQuest, her and her husband, and me and my husband, um, used to log on to EverQuest every Friday night, um, mainly because she was always playing and she was our sugar mama. If we needed anything, she always had the plat to give to us. And um, one, one, one Friday evening, I put on my Ventrilo headset and I wait for that really familiar, you know, Camellia has entered the channel. Anyone who uses like TeamSpeak knows this. And it didn't happen. So at around 7.10, I picked up the phone, and Albert answered it, and I could hear Stephanie crying in the background. And as a best friend, practically my sister, I said, what's wrong? What's wrong? And Albert said, let me hand you the phone. And I handed the phone to Stephanie. And multiple sclerosis that night had decided that her mousing hand wasn't going to work. So she couldn't feel it. And she wasn't going to game. And I kind of, I kind of like really said, wow, like I'm a person of disabilities, but my disability doesn't really affect my gaming. There's probably, if this is doing this to my family, there's probably other people who are, who are having something similar. So I spent all of that night yahooing for information. The reason why I was yahooing is because Google hadn't been invented yet, relax. And I wasn't really finding anything around how people with disabilities are playing video games. So I'm a technologist, and I just decided that this was what we were going to do. And we founded Able Gamers. Um, we were just a little website for the longest time. The idea was we were just going to create like a forum for other people with disabilities to attach to. And the idea was like gamers helping gamers, but that never really took off. Um, and so the maker of the most inaccessible game in the world, anyone want to guess what it is? Rock Band? Um, said, hey, Mark, what you're doing is really important. Here's a check for $5,000. Can you turn this into a real charity? So you know, I think it's funny that the most inaccessible game in the world started, gave us the seed funding for Able Gamers. Um, these are some of the things that we do every day now. Um, Accessibility, I, I put this slide up here because there's a really interesting picture in this slide. Accessibility doesn't always have to be technical. The gentleman to the far right, his name was Gideon. We were at an event, and we had Fruit Ninja up, which was the only game you could play with the Kinect in a wheelchair. And he had a disability, and I don't remember the name of it because it's about this long, but he basically had no arms, but he had hands. And he kept, he was working another booth with his mom, and he kept coming up to the to the um, Fruit Ninja, and he would try to move, but it wasn't detecting him. And we just kind of said, well, what could we do? And all of our equipment was packed in these little green foam things. So we handed him some green foam things. All of a sudden, the Kinect saw him. And he just spent hours playing. And the last picture at the bottom is actually his mom crying behind him because she never thought he would be able to do this. These are the wins that I get to see all the time. We have a fun first philosophy. I talk to a lot of game developers all the time who say, well, I don't want to create, I don't want to add certain features because I think that will make the game less fun. And that's why we had to create this talk. 
as a person who runs Able Gamers, I get people all the time coming to me going like, I want to create a game for people with multiple sclerosis, or people with muscular dystrophy, or people with stage three kidney disease. Those are, someone really came to me and said, I want to create a game for people with stage three kidney disease. I couldn't imagine what that game would have been. But if anyone comes to me and says something like that, you've already failed. People with disabilities don't want to play targeted games. They just, they don't. They want to play the games that include people with muscular dystrophy. They don't want an I win button. They just want to be able to enjoy the content, even if it's not how it was intended to be played. Games that are created specifically for a pers person with disabilities are isolating and often patronizing. I mean, I don't want to play a game that reminds me that I'm disabled every day. They further alienate them from their peer groups, and this is really why games are so important. Look at Rock Band. Who here's played Rock Band? Who here doesn't own Rock Band but played Rock Band? Why? Because it's fun, you're at a party, you're with some friends, you get coerced into it. Um, very few people really played that game by themselves, which is kind of why they're on the rocks right now. Being disabled, especially profoundly disabled, can be really isolating, really isolating. Like think about, you know, we're in New York City right now, but I actually live in West Virginia at the top of a mountain. I work in DC, but I live in the top of a mountain in West Virginia. Do you know how far access an access van comes if you are a disabled person who is profound and needs an access van? Zero. You're in your house, and you're not leaving. And if you want to buy a van, an accessible van is, you have to take a really crappy van that costs like $24,000, and when it's all said and done, it's 87 grand to have a crappy van that has wheelchair stuff on it. So people with disabilities, especially people with disabilities that don't live in urban areas, are socially isolated, and the internet has changed their lives in a way that you cannot imagine, because now they can reach out and see people, talk to people, and really connect. This is a quote from a good friend of mine who said, you know, I suck, you know, I suck at Call of Duty, but I still play it. I used to be a professional first-person shooter, but that's no more because I can't strife walk backwards or do any trick shots. My idea of fun morphed from destroy the competition and laugh with their pain to as long as a mother effer goes down with me, I'm happy. He's not playing the game as the game was intended, but it's still fun for him. Why, 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 why do you care? Harvard actually said, and this, um, this actual study has been used to show that solitary confinement within our prison systems is psych incredibly psychologically damage damaging because they say that social stimulation is important to the brain as food. And that if you don't have social stimulation, um, you kind of just die. I'm not sure what this blank slide was. It really wasn't. So I, as an organization, we as an organization, we do not believe in universal design. Now I know that's, I work with people at Google. I know you guys really don't like that thought process, but I'm gonna explain why. Able Gamer's alternative to universal design is that we be, feel like disabilities are on a spectrum and, and we don't know where on the spectrum, it really doesn't matter. The whole concept that we preach is, this is my fictitious game, Kitten Slayer 2005. It's you just stab kittens as many as you can. If you follow includification, you follow the guidelines that game accessibility teaches you, what we're trying to do is broaden where Kitten Slayer 2015 fits on the spectrum of disabilities. Then we look at where games are across the entire spectrum, and depending on someone's disability, and I don't actually know, like I haven't said this is this disability, we just look at are there things that you can play, because I've talked to so many gamers with disabilities who will tell you, I would rather see a game that forwards gaming 
that I can't play be created, then that game never be created at all. Because I'm a gamer and I love what games do. And while I can't play this one, I might be able to play the next one. Or this game created an AI that is gonna be used now in this game that I can play and love. Because we're gamers first. So this is our alternative design, uh, our, our alternative to universal design. <clears throat> Now, during the day, I do work for the federal government, and what's great about that is with enough time and enough money, you can do anything. <laughs> um, but that's not the case for a lot of for-profit organizations. So what can we do? What are some top-level things? I'm kind of going to go through this fairly quickly for everybody because there's a lot of wins here that are already being done. I built this little word salad here um, because what do all these people have in common? They're gamers. The interesting thing about this word salad is this little piece right here. This is my personal word salad. I have paresis of the left leg because of my military service. My husband, who's sitting right here, has Chart tooth, Chart Marie tooth, CMT is what it's called. Stephanie, has, who I talked to you about earlier, has multiple sclerosis. My mother recently died of a stroke. And Steve has spinal muscular atrophy. These are all disabilities just within my life. What can we do to help them? Well, inclusification is broken down into levels, the idea being that everything in level one and most of level two is technically feasible right now. Um, remappable keys, these are common now. Camera controls, less common. Third party access, this is where we get to that blizzard banning people because they didn't like third party access. Movable UIs, let me, if I have limited motion, let me put all the important stuff in an area of the screen that I can get to. When you get into level three, some of the challenges with level three is they actually cannibalize some of the other disabilities. So you have to be really careful when you get into level three, and that's where options come in. Why not have a several ways to do something? In my kitten killer game, you didn't just stab them, you could club them. That guy is not liking my game. <laughs> I have three cats. I love my cats. So you have to ask yourself questions. Can I play this with a keyboard? Can I play this with just a mouse? Can I move the triggers from the side to the top? Now, interestingly enough, game companies have done such a terrible job at this that Microsoft PlayStation has actually solved the problem because they've put remappability in the console level. So, you know, Game X, you didn't do it, don't worry, we're gonna actually put at the OS level that the trigger button is now the X button. So, you know, that's where a company st stepped up and saved everybody, and they did it purely for the point of accessibility. Here are some of the devices that we've created as able gamers to help people with disabilities be able to, to play with mobility disabilities, and here's some of people using these devices. These are real devices people are using every day. Visual impairments. These are some of the things, color changing text. This is something most people don't actually um, think about, but if I have a visual impairment, maybe I want to make a really high contrast of the text that's important to me. Let me get rid of some of the text. Colorblind is a big deal. Um, text-to-speech output, which is in level three now, but is actually really should be more in level one now because technology has made text-to-speech really easy. Colorblindness is the big one. 8% um, of men are colorblind, but only 0.5% of women are colorblind. So, you know, there's one women finally win in this case. Um, the red-green is the most common. Does anyone know what the least common is? It's the 12, orange blue. It's super rare. And interestingly enough, I think mainly women. Um, dogs aren't colorblind. They can see color, just not all the colors. I will tell you a funny story about this slide. I actually used this slide at an um, event that had all the chief technology officers for all the big companies that were out there. It was, I met Oprah. Like I was super nervous giving this talk because there was just every who's who in the audience. And when I got back to my desk, when I got back to my little seat, 
the CEO, uh, chief technology officer for a major grocery store set, chain said, hey, about your colorblind slide, there wasn't a number in one of those circles. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, there was. He's like, no, there wasn't. And I'm like, yeah, you should probably go see your doctor. <laughs> and it was the one in the bottom, the small one, 42. He couldn't see that, um, which is a pretty rare one. So yay, slides work. If everyone can see numbers, if you don't see numbers, go see your doctor. So what do game companies do? So game companies use color, but they also use symbols. Symbols are a big deal. If you look at like Bejeweled or you look at you know, Candy Crush, there's color, but every little piece of candy is also shaped differently because you can match shapes or you can ma match colors. Um, this is um, Star Wars The Old Republic, and that is the same, the screen that's large on the right, you can see it on the left and the different types of color blindness that there is. Hearing impairments. If you are a gamer with a hearing impairment, the world is in a pretty good shape for you. Um, this is closed captioning. We'd li we like to see more than closed captioning. We would like to also see event captioning. You hear a sound to your left, things like that. Um, more and more games are doing that. Um, changing colored fonts, things like that. But why this has really become almost moot and almost every game has it. Does anyone know why? Why almost every game now has closed captioning? Here's some examples of closed captioning, by the way. Exactly. Here's one. The reason why is because of localization. So if you put in the closed captioning and you, and you lay that all in, you can send your closed captioning file off to a company, and you can then use it as subtitles in various languages. So that's, you know, this ability to want to sell your game in non-English speaking places has become great for the need of closed captioning. So it's closed captioning in an, in, in an English speaking country and it's subtitles everywhere else. Learning impairments. So learning impairments is one of the hardest ones to really take on, but it's actually not. Tutorials and sandboxes. When you're working with people who have learning impairments, what you're really wanting to do is giving them a safe place to practice. When we work with, with people with autism, what we find oftentimes is they easily get frustrated, and I'm being very general now because the spectrum of people, everyone manifests differently what's, what, what, how they operate in the world. But you want to just make sure that they're not frustrated. So if you create sandboxes, you create tutorials, time-based games. You know, one of, the, one of the greatest games that's an example of it is Civilizations because it's turn-based. You can take forever to make your turn, forever. The game doesn't care because there's no clock, there's no speed. There's also a sandbox mode. Um, tutorials, um, intuitive menus, um, videos, in fact, um, YouTube has done great for, um, for people with learning impairments because they go watch Twitch, they go watch other people play, play, play the game and that way they get comfortable with the content. Um, so this game right here, I can never say the name of it. Um, the lead storyteller said that they spent so much time working on the story that they created this menu right up at the front that said, you know, that you could say, tell me a story, you know, give me a challenge. And what it was was, it was actually an accessibility feature that was hidden for the casual gamer, but as well as other people, where depending on what you chose, what he said was, we spent countless hours telling a great story. It would be tragic if in the first jump puzzle, someone couldn't get through it and never gets to the end. So they use this so that the game will actually say, if you're in a quick time event, hey, I noticed you're having problems. You want to skip it? Now, it won't do that in some of the other modes. But in the tell me a story, it will. It brings the enemies down. It puts auto-targeting on. So that someone who just wants to enjoy this game from a story perspective can, but those that really want to hardcore it also have that option. No one complained. No one said anything. Regulatory environment. So um, I'm hoping, I haven't gotten the answer yet, but we're doing a talk at GDC this year on the CVAA. 
It had a two-year extension. It is in full effect. For anyone who's working on games in the Google space, you're, you're aware of this. And it's about um, communications. Anything that's a communications device must be able to be used by people with disabilities. Um, so captioning, things like that. Um, it's mainly affecting consoles and platforms. Um, we're still trying to figure out what it does in the actual game space. Um, if you do any content, and I know that Google actually does do content for government and state and local, oftentimes 508, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1976 comes into play, which is an accessibility requirements, because um, when the government pays for it, everyone has to be able to enjoy it. Um, I know California actually adopt, adopted a local California level 508. They just literally cloned 508 out of the Rehabilitation Act. It was just, um, all of the stuff was just redone to better align with YCAG, if anyone's familiar with YCAG, which is the European standards, or the st just, like, just like the metric system, YCAG is what everyone else uses, and 508 is what the United States uses. Um, there was a lot of pushback from the rest of the world, rightfully. And so um, in the last refresh, which just finished in January, they now better align. So 508 actually went into line with YCAG because a lot more thought had been put into it. So um, that's where the regulatory. In Europe, Europe is a different story. Um, the EU was really hasn't hasn't really figured out exactly what they're going to do from a games perspective yet. So this is where I open it up for questions. Um, this is one of my favorite slides, by the way. Any questions? Yes. So is there like, a sort of accessibility rating system that uh, an organization like yours does for all games that come out? So his question was, was there a disability ratings scheme system um, for when games come out? And the answer to that is no. And we will fight you tooth and nail not to have it. The reason being is, if you show me someone with multiple sclerosis, you show me 10 people with multiple sclerosis, I'll show you 10 people that need something different. So it's almost impossible. What we advocate for is for them to, for game companies to put out a checklist of things that they do. So, you know, we have remappability. We have, so all of the things we talked about, we asked them to do a checklist. And what we do from a review perspective is we go through the checklist. Person with disabilities knows what they're looking for. So the rating system just doesn't work. Yes, sir. Um, regarding this is maybe trailing off to a slightly politically incorrect topic, but when you speak with these companies or these CEOs of these game companies, how is your message received by both the leadership and then the developers in those companies? I'm really glad you asked that because I want to tell you the, 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 you know, it wasn't a plant question, but I'm glad you asked it. So the stories I told you were from four years ago and seven years ago. I actually just got back from PlayStation because they have internal accessibility policies now. I, I, I've actually had like a real crisis of where Able Gamers goes in the last six months because it dawned on us and the weight of what we did is a couple of really passionate gamers, and I mean really a couple, we could fill the first row of this auditorium, was banging on the door of a $16 billion industry for 15 years. It's now a $64 billion dollar industry, and we affected change. A handful of people. I kid you not, 15 passionate gamers. And now the major game companies have all reached out and said, help us create guidelines that we will enforce in our internal studios, and we will suggest in our third parties. Think about that. Like, you know, my mission was to get people with disabilities, and the first part of doing that mission was getting game companies to understand that people with disabilities were a market, not a sad story. That we had a trillion dollars in income, and we wanted to spend it 
on games as part of our entertainment. Like, make the game. I will give you the money. So we created this dialogue that talked about gamers with disabilities as a market, not a sad story. And we banged on the door. We banged on the door. And now we have game companies, the big boys, who are going, yeah, don't worry about that. We've done that. Yeah, that's done. What's next? Let's go to the next thing. Let's, let's figure this out. VR, here's what we've already done for VR. What have we missed? Well, what about this? Oh, yeah, let's talk about that. So to your point, we won. That battle is won now. And it was because a handful of really passionate bullies banged on the door and finally got in. So thank you for asking that question. So what do we do now, by the way? We give grants out. We give tons of grants because a lot of the equipment you see is handmade, custom built. And people with disabilities told you about the story about being in rural and not holding up, affording a van. Trust me, a $500 controller might as well be $5 million. So we just give them out. Like my Thursday is literally just printing labels. So any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for you know, having a great time. Thank you for Tracy, and I appreciate it. Take care. <laughs>